Hello, good evening, thank you for coming. I'm Paul Mason and I'm a journalist who writes books and sometimes plays and sometimes film scripts and sometimes novels and a lot of the time doesn't write at all because I am so angry <laughs> with the world as it is. Uh, the work I try to do, especially in my books, is to understand where the current crisis we are living through came from, how we might be able to solve it, and how we can project what the modern left always fears to project, which is a coherent, long-term vision of where society should go. Now, in 2015, I wrote a book called Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future, where I tried to analyze more deeply than I'd done before so I covered the 2008 crisis. I was standing outside Lehman Brothers in New York when it went bust. And I wrote things about that. But in post-capitalism, I tried to dig deeper to, to try and find the sources of, of the crisis. And I came to the conclusion that, of course, what we are living through is the end of a neoliberal era. It is a, it is a model of capitalism that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we are living through the end. It no longer works. But beneath that, I, th I think we are seeing a clash between technology and society. We are seeing, in fact, exactly the kind of clash Karl Marx predicted between the, the technology that is emerging around automation, digital networks, and in the future, artificial intelligence, and the social relations which which we reproduce every day of markets, of private ownership, of the private ownership of information. And I said, what we're seeing the beginnings of is a transition, not just away from neoliberalism, because I think another capitalism will replace neoliberalism. It has to, because it's dying. But beyond that, we are at the start of a long transition, like the transition between feudalism and capitalism, in which information technology will blow apart the social relationships of capitalism as we know them. It will take a long time. It will feel slow. Many of the things we do don't, won't even feel like they make sense. But in the four years since I wrote the book, some of the things I advocated ha are actually being proposed by people who have never even read my book. Now, that's both gratifying and disappointing. But Elizabeth Warren, the presidential candidate in America, advocates the breaking up of big tech monopolies. Cities like Barcelona, some of whom in the uh, administration have read my book, are advocating the suppression of platform monopolies, which is what I argued in the book. The other reason I wanted to write the book was to tr I had been part of the anti-capitalist left. I had been part of the traditional hierarchical Trotskyist left for my whole life until around 2000, when I was 40 years old. And I was really inspired by the Seattle protest. And I switched, I became uh, converted to small-scale, horizontal uh, struggle, not often carried out in a suit, but um, carried out nevertheless. I, beca I became converted to to that way of thinking, but I was always frustrated at the philosophy of one no and many yeses. Because although I believe that is a good way to produce innovative struggle, it left us without a vision to offer. And now, as we enter this crisis where the right is rising, where nationalism and misogyny and racism are taking over the edges of the political sphere, this is where we feel the absence of a coherent objective. Uh, and writing post-capitalism was my attempt to, to, to say to the left, look, there is a transition beyond capitalism. It is not the traditional one which socialists argued for, which is based on scarcity and planning, but it is indeed based on the granular emergence of small-scale islands of abundance, of reducing work time, using automation and data to reduce the amount of work we need to do on this planet to keep ourselves going. And I believe that there is, in, in this sense, what the Americans call route one, 
There's a direct route beyond capitalism that doesn't have to go through this classic period of repression and scarcity, which old-style Marxism argued for. Now, as I was writing it, I also asked myself, is there anybody else who made that journey? Because I want to know if somebody else has written stuff like this. And there were a, a few writers of the same stature as me, but one was a revelation. And this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. I won't really talk much about my book, my thesis. I will talk about his book and his thesis. This is Alexander Bogdanov. And he's handsome. Yeah. <laughs> um, born in 1873 in Russia, he was a Bolshevik. He was one of the first 15 Bolsheviks. And his job before the 1905 revolution in the Bolshevik party, faction of the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party was to rob banks. He was a doctor, in fact, a, a uh, hematologist. He was a, he was a scientific researcher all his life into hematology. His job was to raise money for the Bolsheviks by robbing banks. And he was seen as an absolute key intellectual in the Bolshevik movement. The 1905 revolution fails. He, Lenin, everyone else, isn't Trotsky, are going to exile. And this, this is where Alexander Bogdanov started to draw different conclusions to Lenin. And so Bogdanov said the 1905 revolution failed because the working class were not conscious enough. They were not educated enough. And he predicted something very, very important when we know what happened in the 20th century. He said really early on, because of this, they will become prey to dictatorial methods by any party that represents them. So he, he almost predicted Stalinism. And indeed, as we will see, lived through the beginnings of Stalinism. Um, he also went into a huge fight with Lenin, therefore, over what to do. Because Lenin and classic Marxism, Marxism has a kind of two souls. One says it's really important to educate workers so they know what's happening and they can make conscious uh, choices, like the workers Marx knew in Paris in, 18, in the 1848 revolution. Another theory says it doesn't matter what's in their heads, they will be forced to destroy capitalism because of necessity. And Bogdanov was on the side that said, without knowledge and a clear philosophy of change, the workers will get nowhere. And so this brought him into conflict with Lenin. And it all came to a head here. Um, Bogdanov is there on the right. Lenin in the bowler hat is um, playing chess with Bogdanov. And this is the island of Capri in Italy in the year 1908. Um, Bogdanov won the chess match. Uh, I, I'd love to do, to, to do a, a hologram of, that, um, of the chess match and re -do, position the pieces and work out whether Lenin could have won. But um, more importantly, by now, they were really arguing on several levels, not just educated workers versus dumb workers as the agent of history, but Bogdanov said something also really, really important, I think, for, for me as someone who has made a move towards understanding systems theory as, as, a, as a modern version of being able to understand complexity that is, to me, more, more supple than pure dialectical materialism. Bogdanov, in, in this period, 1905 to 1908, had this huge battle with Lenin over something absolutely ridiculous, which is whether or not Ernst Mach, who had discovered uh, shock waves, was a materialist. And Lenin, you, those of you who have been Leninists or on the left, wrote a book that most leftists have never read. It's called Materialism and Empirio Criticism. And Lenin, it was a, a complete attack on Alexander Bogdanov. Because, because Lenin's saying, look, because modern science is moving away from this Hegelian dialectic thesis, antithesis, synthesis, towards understandings of complexity and indeterminacy, 
This is the period of Einstein. This is the period of, uh, of the Schrodinger, the, all of the, the emergence of particle physics. Lenin says, this is all wrong. Bogdanov said, no, it may be that this new science is actually a better way of capturing reality than Marxist Hegelian materialism. And so Lenin spends an entire book attacking him. And this argument is what was going on here in Capri. Why were they in Capri? Because Maxim Gorky is behind them, looking like this. Who's winning? Maxim Gorky had a villa on Capri. And, they, and Bogdanov said, we need to educate the workers. And so they held a workers' university for the Russian exiles on Capri. And Lenin is there teaching, and so is Bogdanov. But they're just fighting each other. And shortly after this, Lenin is in his apartment in Paris, where he's based, and the Bolsheviks meet, and they expel Bogdanov. Because Bogdanov also had big tactical differences over whether they should stand in elections. He didn't want to stand in the elections. I don't think he was wrong. I think Lenin was right. Standing in elections is a good thing. Um, but anyway, so Bogdanov is now out. He's spent his entire life. He's in exile. He's a wanted man. He's out of the party. What does he do? He writes this. Red Star, a utopia which is the first Bolshevik science fiction novel. And um, it exists, it's in Spanish, La Estrella Roja. Uh, and um, in my book, I used uh, an analysis of it to show why my vision of a post-capitalist world and a post-capitalist transition does have roots in the historic traditions of Marxism and, and people who have read Marx, and that there is, in fact, contained in this novel, an entire universe of possibilities for how we build a society without class, without gender oppression, uh, and without property. It was an immediate hit. It came out in Russia as an underground uh, novel. Workers read it. Even though they knew Bogdanov was out, everybody was out by then. Trotsky's out. Everybody's, they're, they're, they're fighting, so it doesn't matter. What it's really about is this. So, it's, it's a story about a communist society that exists on Mars. Um, I'll tell you the story briefly. There is a Bolshevik who is suffering uh, after the... Uh, repression of the 1905 revolution. His name is Leonid. Leonid has also just been dumped by his girlfriend, so he's doubly sad. And um, one night, um, a Martian comes and abducts him and takes him to Mars. And on Mars, there is a communist society, and the, much of the novel is about Leonid learning from the communist society what communism could be like. Now, it, you get three pages into it and you realize the whole thing is a polemic against Lenin. Because the communism that Leonid experiences is one that has been achieved peacefully over a long-term transition without the need for the dictatorship of the proletariat and the forced march of Stalinist planning. Um, and it is classless. It's almost sexless. It's, it, it, there is no gender oppression, and gender identities are almost absent. Um, and it's all based on information. It's very interesting. Now, the genius behind the premise that Mars could have communism were these canals that, in the year 1877, uh, um, the Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli discovered that Mars was crisscrossed with, with canals that could only have been made by intelligent, human be intelligent beings. And therefore, from the whole period, from the 1870s, right through until the year that Lenin played chess and Bogdanov wrote the book, it was a it was believed by rational people 
that, that Mars was full of straight-lying canals. Um, in fact, it's rubbish. There are no canals on Mars. There is, no, there is nothing, Mare Australe, you know, canal number 256, none of it exists. But if you Google um, Schiaparelli, you can see the images he was working from, and they, they only, you can only see these at a, at a certain point when the sun and the earth and, the, and Mars are in, in a, an alignment. Anyway, it's rubbish. They don't exist. But, but the premise of Bogdanov's novel is if there are beings enough, clever enough to build massive straight line canals across a planet the size of Mars, they must have communism. Um, and, it's a, and, and actually, in the book, what he says is that the need to build these canals under Martian capitalism was what created a kind of statist capitalism that very easily grew over into a communism without the need, like for a, in, 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 in China and Russia, to have a peasant war and lots of famines. This, the, the need to build these canals was, a, was a, a joint enterprise by, originally, the Martian capitalists and the Martian working class. Incidentally, the Martians in the book do look like that. Uh, that is what they are supposed to look like. You could say that he inspired E.T. as well. Um, so, what does Leonid find on Mars? All labor is voluntary because the machines produce everything that is needed and there is abundance. And so, all that happens is a big clicky, clicky notice board, like you see on an old railway station, comes up with, we need so many workers uh, to produce some uh, extra machinery, and people voluntarily stop their leisure, and they go to the relevant part of Mars where this production or mining or whatever is going on. So the first thing is that necessary labor, compulsory labor, has been abolished. On top of that, Leonid is taken to discover that in this communist society, culture and leisure are the way of life. It is a classless, but it also is, uh, it is in this sense, like Marx describes famously in his 1844 manuscripts, you people can hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, shoot in the evening, criticize literature at night. This is the uh, life that, 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 that Bogdanov describes and that Le Leonid experiences. All production is automated. Machines work themselves. Mankind, or Martian kind, has stood to the side of the production process and doesn't need to do anything. And, amazingly, he doesn't describe how, because he could not imagine it, something keeps everything in equilibrium. Something continually calculates the needs, the supplies, the amount of labor, Something is keeping everything in, in order. There is a system. It is a self-automating social system. Uh, he couldn't even Im imagine an, an electronic calculating machine, let alone a computer. But he imagined what a computer can do. Because the key to the whole system, through this clicky, clicky notice board, is real-time data. This was... In 1908, a communist imagining what you could do in an economy where data was available, all data, comprehensive data, was available in real time. And as in all utopian science fiction novels, of course, there is free love. Because Leonid is really fed up that his girlfriend has left him. By the time he leaves Mars, he's not so unhappy. Um, people switch gender identities easily. You can't tell what, who's what. And again, 1908, eight years after Oscar Wilde is jailed for being gay, a communist is imagining what it would be like to live in a non-gender stereotypical world. And the culture, it, he spends great, um, a lot of time describing the calmness with which people face danger, the lack of emotion, but the deep emotion, but the lack of the, the lack of fear um, and the technocratic way in which people operate. He was really impressed by the, the, the way an industrialized 
um, an educated set of people can deal with very complicated and frightening situations by just sticking to the task. A bit like if you see on battleships. I think he was quite impressed, you know, the battleship Potemkin was full of Bolsheviks, and, and he was quite Im impressed with that kind of calm, naval, technocratic way of life. So that's what it's like on, on Mars under communism. And another really interesting thing is the way he describes how the, the, the Martian men, or men he means human, Martians, yeah, control the machines. He says he can't see how they do it, but somehow a delicate thread connects their brain to the machine. So again, he's imagining software. He's imagining an information system whereby the knowledge in people's brains is constantly updated and that they can control the machines not without even really using their hands. So this is fantastic. This, is, this makes the novel worth reading on its own. And to describe Martian communism in a, in a Marxist sense, if we build up from the bottom, the, the, the relations of production are based on real-time data, the application of systems theory, the automation of production and the en embrace of a if, humanistic or Martianistic culture to make everyone able to live this free life that the automation has produced for them. That, of course, is what Mars really looks like. There are no canals, but that's how Martian communism works uh, when in the year 1908 when Leonid discovers it. But, and this is what the novel story relates to, because it's all very happy and free love, etc. But there's a problem. A huge crisis is looming for Martian communism because by building the canals, they've depleted the planet. They burned all the coal. They started burning down the forests. And what has happened, and, and little old Alexander Bogdanov in 1908, with his lovely blonde hair and his beard, uses the word climate change. The climate has changed because of what you've done. He, he really explains that nature is not something passive, that the planet Earth or the planet Mars is not something passive which humans or Martians simply live on, but that we, through our action as species, co-create nature. This is an amazingly profound uh, ecological vision of the relationship between living things and planets that, again, is way ahead of its time. And what's the conclusion that Bogdanov wants us to draw? It is that growth, abundance, great though they are, automation, culture, leisure, superb though it would be to live in this situation, always have ecological limits. And so for me, this is what makes Bogdanov one of the first true eco-socialists. Even though he's talking about Mars, he's really talking about a problem within Marxism. Marx, Engels, though they were aware of the uh, ecological limits to growth, always assumed that they would be overcome by technological innovation. And what Bogdanov says is it's unlikely. Even if we get communism, we still have to look after the planet because it, we co-create it um, with, the, with, with nature itself. Now, why do you think this might be important to us today? Um, there's NASA's uh, picture from a moving simulation, I took this off YouTube, of the ice at the, uh, at the North Pole. It's not just that it's receded. In, that, in September 1984, when that picture was taken, I was on a picket line in the miners' strike. I was an adult. Today, I'm still a slightly older adult, but in half a lifetime, we've almost destroyed the Arctic ice and its ability to reproduce itself. Because don't just look at the extent, look at the color. The, the whitest bits are the oldest bits of the ice, five years or more old. It reproduces itself. It swirls around this bit above Canada, where it says more videos, that bit. 
It swirls around and reproduces. Today, that process is just depleted. The old ice is almost gone. The new ice has to be formed every year, and we're only a few, we're only an accident away from it not being formed. We have, says the International Panel on Climate Change, 12 years to act decisively. We need to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees above its pre-industrial average. To do that, we're going to have to halve the emissions of the world by 2030. And by 2050, we have to be net neutral. The, the, the carbon produced has to be offset by carbon absorbed, or we will face a climate catastrophe. And that's not just a theory, it is a theory provable by all the evidence we have. Now, this, of course, stimulates a debate on the left about what to do. And right now, for us in the English-speaking world, it is the American left, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Edward Markey, the two, uh, uh, Republic, the, the two Democrat uh, Congress people who've proposed the so-called Green New Deal. If you haven't read it, I'm sure there will be a Spanish translation. It is an inspiring document. It's the most comprehensive plan to take a major country and stop it producing carbon. It, it says things like, take all petrol cars off the roads by 2030, re-equip the whole of America with, with automobiles, and more, a comprehensive health system, because it is the human cost of inequality that is also we need to, to, to deal with alongside climate change. I regard the document that Cortez, uh, Ocasio-Cortez produced as, as a historic turning point in the politics of climate change because somebody finally had the, 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 yeah, the, the, the courage to, to imagine something drastic. But, but now, of course, the problem we have is that they're surrounded by Trump, by the far right, by the trade unions who don't want to do this, and by climate change deniers. And we, they're being hemmed in. The, the horizons of this deal are being pushed back. And so what you now get is, is a debate like this. And it, the, the, the American left is asking them, themselves, can capitalism afford a rapid transition beyond carbon? So they have to come up with ways of uh, paying for it. They have to borrow a lot of money, and then the central bank prints a lot of money. And there's a huge debate, which I'm involved in, about how we do this. I think we can do that. They ask, can we adapt institutionally to a zero net carbon project? Can the American trade unions accept that there will not be fossil fuel extraction? Can the fossil fuel industry accept that $4 trillion worth of its assets will be wiped out. That $4 trillion figure is a Bank of England figure. It's not some wild leftist projection. Can, at the same time, we maintain the global multilateral treaties that we need to do this? Probably not. Trump pulled out of the Paris climate ch change. Bolsonaro stays in power. Forget the Amazon. The Amazon is gone. And can we dis defeat the far right, which is on a worldwide campaign against climate science, against all science? Now, the beauty of Bogdanov's book is, again, that I think he basically says, these are all very interesting questions, but they're the wrong questions. Because, now, now these stills, after Bogdanov's book, when the Soviet Union was formed and had a film industry, one of the results of having the first ever sci-fi Bolshevik novel in Russia was that the, Bo that the Bolshevik film industry became obsessed with Martians. And this is from a 1924 movie uh, called Alalea, the Queen of the Martians. And as you can see, she meets some Bolsheviks. With, you know, they're playing the accordion, and they have some nice um, uh, leather trousers on. Um, but, but Bogdanov really says, look, even if we achieve communism, we still have to manage the planet. And so, what happens? <coughs> He's saying the Martians have lots of advantages over the real humans. The Martians are actually a metaphor. The Martians are a metaphor for the human beings that have already achieved communism. And he, he makes this clear in a poem he writes called A Martian Stranded on Earth. 
It's a beautiful poem where the Martian is stranded on earth and hates it because we're so uncivilized. And the Martian says, but then I realized, then I realized humans are just a childlike version of what we have become. And that together we can create a, a, a communist universe. They have a single language on Mars, so they never had international warfare. There are no nations. The revolutions were peaceful because the peasantry was quickly industrialized. And there is total science. Nobody on Mars objects to climate science. And yet, says Bogdanov, despite all these advantages, their planet is in crisis. And so what do they do? The crux of the novel is a conflict on Mars between two factions. One faction says, we have to colonize the Earth. Our planet is dying. There's a bunch of uncivilized ruffians called humans. They'll never achieve communism. Look what just happened in Russia. The 1905 revolution failed. Lenin's an asshole. Kill the humans. Kill the humans and occupy Earth. And the person who advocates this is, is a Martian called Sterny. They work with weird names. Sterny. But Leonid has an ally called Netty who says, no, we shouldn't do this. I've got a plan for colonizing Venus. And it's, Venus is a hellhole. We'll probably all die. But we should try, even if many of us do die, at, at great cost, great physical cost, great Martian cost, we should do it. And, and the argument that, that, that Netty uses is this. Now I've done something. One second. Sterney, either we halt the growth of our own population and thereby Im impair the entire development of our life, or we colonize Earth, having first exterminated its inhabitants. Neti, the argument for colonizing Venus. Earthlings are not just simply lower and weaker people than us. They are different. If we eliminate them, we will not replace them in the process of universal evolution, but we will merely fill in a mechanic mechanically the vacuum that we have created in a world of life forms. So this is ultimate, the ultimate naturalist. In a way, it's the humanist response. Don't kill the earthlings. They might be useful, the same as... Um, we don't kill species if we can help it because we don't know what species on this planet could be, how useful a butterfly or a caterpillar could be once we discover more knowledge about them. And so what happens is, in the novel, Leonid, uh, unfortunately, kills Sterney. He murders what the, the pro-extermination guy and is sent back to Earth uh, to suffer the... Uh, the post-1905 um, repression, and, uh, and that's it. Now, I want you to just think for a minute about this. On your knees or on your desk, on your seats, there are envelopes with the options. There's only two you need to really b bother with. There's four sheets because we could discuss them if we get more time. But there's, there's four sheets. There's a blue one and a white one. That's the ones I want you to think about. White one, exterminate the humans, colonize Earth. Blue one, colonize Venus, preserve the humans, but at great cost. And I just want you to think for 30 seconds about what you would do. And at the end of that 30 seconds, I want you to hold up one of the choices. And your 30 seconds starts now. Five seconds left. So what are you going to do? If you're a Martian, oh, there's a lot of... Now it's interesting. Keep your hands up if you're exterminating the humans. Put them down if you're, if you're colonizing Venus. Okay, so the, the, there's about a third. Everybody, put, the others put your hands up. Who wants to... 
Who wants to colonize Venus? So you're the humanists, okay? So there are many, many more humanists than there are. Um, and Bogdanov, um, the whole purpose of, that, of the exercise he did, he wrote another uh, sci-fi novel about how they got to communism on Mars. Um, the purpose was to show something, which I think is relevant to us. Bogdanov believed that to get communism, you need a conscious agent of history. It has to know exactly what it is planning. It cannot be an unconscious bearer of social relations. It must have the project in its mind. And that brings you back to what I was trying to do in the book, Post Capitalism, to bring a conscious project and a conscious understanding of the obstacles to that project. And that's what Alexander Bogdanov tried to bring to 20th century Marxism. I'll for the last minute I'm going to speak, I'll tell you what happened to him. <coughs> he went back into medicine, but when the revolution happened, he was back into the Bolshevik uh, life. And he is a key figure in something called the Prolet Cult, which is an arts festival. Those of you who are involved in the history of art, the Prolet Cult was an attempt exactly to create a conscious, self-educated working class in Russia to combat what? The rising threat of bureaucracy. So he was an ally of a feminist Bolshevik called Alexander Kollontai, who was uh, also building a, an, a workers' opposition to Lenin, even when Lenin was alive, and so was he. And it was closed down, the prolet cult, because they, they knew it would be, it produced some great art and great cultural output, but they knew it would, that it was a different project to theirs. In the, meaning, in the intervening period, he had written three massive books which are now seen as the pre precursors to systems theory. He left behind dialectical materialism and embraced something he called tectology. But really, the, 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 the founders of systems theory in the 1940s realized that these works were incredibly um, prescient uh, uh, precursors of systems theory. So that's the other thing. And the final thing he did, because I also think he was quite mad, that he believed hematology had just really discovered blood transfusions. And he had the theory, completely wrong as it turned out, that, that, that you could do blood transfusions between people of different blood types, and indeed that if you swapped somebody's blood out of their body and replaced it with somebody else's, it could cure disease. And being an experimental scientist, he hooked himself up to somebody with TB and swapped blood with them. And the person with TB didn't die, but Alexander Bogdanov died in 1928. So that's him. That's the finish of this. We'll have some questions. Thank you. Sit there. Great. Okay. Bueno, no tenemos mucho tiempo. Tenemos unos cinco, cinco diez minutillos. Pero eh, si os parece, abrimos a un par de preguntillas. Alguna por ahí? Ahí tenemos una. Si hay micrófonos, ahí hay otra. Y creo que ya. Había una ahí al fondo también. Vale. Si sí, sí, hay tiempo, pues. Hi. Um, could you say a little bit about tech tectology? What is tectology? And uh, yeah, how did how did Bogdanov think about production in uh, in a, in, his, in on on Mars or yeah? How did he what? How do you think about production yeah, and okay. tectology? What is that about? Yeah. So. For Bogdanov, technology was an attempt to create a universal science of sciences. That is, in the sense, to dis discover universal laws of motion of intellectual systems uh, and to, um, to argue that 
if you, if you hear physicists say that one day we will achieve a science of everything, uh, so that, you know, um, that everything will be ex explicable and all the gaps between layers of science, say between biology, chemistry, uh, genetics, physics, will be filled in and there'll be a universal set of laws within human knowledge. That was what he did. And so, look, the, this was in the age of speculative thought. So the work itself, technology, is quite mad in, in some ways, but in, in, in outlining what the... the, the for, for Marxists, you know, the, you, if, if you're a Marxist anywhere on earth in uh, the year 1920, you're being told that Marxism, as Xi Jinping says today, mm -hmm. is a theory of reality. It's not just a theory of so social history, and it's a theory that explains matter in motion. These are Xi Jinping's words borrowed from Engels. And, 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 and the, the beauty of, of Bogdanov's move away from that is that he says, no, the, the science of everything will be provided by science and not social thought. But the, the job of the social philosopher is to shape the way the, the science and the social science interact with each other. All his works are being gradually translated into English. I don't know about Spanish, but we are getting there's some good, uh, there's a good summary uh, volume now of his basic works uh, that came out in 2015 in, uh, in English that, that, that has got, that wasn't the end of his thinking because after technology, he tried to, he went further towards trying to systematize the idea of a, of a replacement for Marxism based on science. So, you know, but it's a niche area. We had one, uh, teníamos una pregunta ahí al fondo y una más aquí y ahí sí que cerramos. Eh, mi inglés es bastante limitado, entonces si le pudieras traducir la pregunta. Bueno, tiene traducción vez. simultánea. Ah, estupendo. Sí. It's gone off. Hold on. Yeah. Ok. Sí. Eh, bueno, me, me ha encantado que, que Bogdanov, que, que fuera un visionario también respecto a temas ecológicos, pero, pero me ha parecido ver que, que era un poco tecno-optimista. Y, y bueno, al final vemos también cómo acabó por confiar en una ciencia que todavía no era lo suficientemente avanzada. Eh, ¿Cree usted que, que vamos, que el tiempo nos lleva mucha ventaja y aparte el fascismo también, teniendo en cuenta que en el primer mundo hay cierta conciencia de los límites al crecimiento, pero que en ningún momento se habla de decrecimiento, de redistribución de la riqueza y sobre todo de limitar el crecimiento de la población? Que esto en tres cuartas partes del mundo no se está haciendo y perfectamente en los 12 años que nos queda que dicen para el cambio climático, podemos tener 3.000 millones más de personas. Cuando realmente se empezaron a usar los efectos, habrá cientos de millones de refugiados climáticos. Y los fascistas ya llevan años hablando de cerrar fronteras y levantar muros. Entonces, si tenemos que esperar a que llegue una tecnología mientras siguen naciendo cientos de millones de futuras víctimas, creo que vamos con un poco de retraso y que quizás no es el discurso más acertado. I'll take this last yeah, question yeah. too, and then. Eh, pasamos a esta pregunta también. La recogemos las dos, and then you can yeah, answer yeah. both. Uh, y responde a las dos. <coughs> yes. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was, uh, I'm now researching about the field of impact investment, all this movement, uh, as British, I'm sure you know about it. So I would like to know your perspective on that, your view. Of impact investment? Yes, yeah, social impact investment, social yeah. finance, all this movement that we are seeing, social entrepreneurship and all this thing. Uh, how do you see it from your perspective? Thank you. Let, let me answer the thing about degrowth. Um, so in post-capitalism, I, I, tr I tried not to write, here's my answer. I said, Rather, here's my post-it notes with the questions that, that we should put collectively answer. <clears throat> but the project I would, the, 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 the first stages of post-capitalism for me are, I call it project zero. So it's using the zero marginal cost impact of technology to reduce the cost of living on the planet so that we don't have to live on our wages because we won't, there won't be enough work. The second thing is um, to zero carbon. Um, you know, the third thing is maximum recyclability. Uh, so zero work, zero cost, maximum recyclability, circularity, and zero carbon. These things to me 
go alongside each other because I just don't think that the social relations of capitalism can survive the, the, the radical and rapid transition that we need to make to achieve the climate change targets. Now, when you say this, this is like, this is like really depressing for people, and it shouldn't be. Because for people in the climate movement, they go, shit, you know, we spent all this time trying to persuade the capitalists that they could achieve um, the climate change goals without changing capitalism, and you're telling us we have to destroy capitalism at the same time. And even Ocasio-Cortez's people, when I say this to them, they say, look, look, you know, it's too, it's too much of a head fuck for America. If you try and tell them that they have to attack capitalism at the same time as attacking the carbon industry. But I think it's self-evident that the scale of, and radicalization is going to require something that removes private sector control over carbon production at least. But then when we think about what kind of economy can survive this transition, for me it is precisely, and this links your question as well, it is w the kind of things that we see here in Barcelona or in Madrid, hundreds of cooperatives, hundreds of small-scale projects where work is done partly voluntarily, where the market is not the, the primary driver. To a capitalist, this looks like a set of hobbyists. It's just your hobby. It's irrelevant. To me, it looks like the future. And in the post-capitalism book, I try to explain my, my one contribution to social thought about transitions beyond capitalism is that the state, for me, has to take control or, ch or take leadership and create an environment w in which all these experimental things like Adekolao, you know, uh, bit, uh, blockchain, di digital democracy in Barcelona, that the state must take uh, control of this. When I speak to people who are involved, even now in this movement, the peer-to-peer -peer movement, the c digital commons, it's very rare to find somebody who agrees with me. In fact, it is said that when Barcelona is at the conferences of the peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> movements, it is only Colau and her allies, my friend Francesca Bria, who is the technology officer here, um, who argue for this. And I would like to think I had some impact in, in saying the state must do the transition as well as the, uh, the experimenters. Now, in terms of investing, just very briefly, I'll come to growth in a minute. I do think that the role of the state in this transition is to shape the priorities of the private sector. I I've learned from being a business journalist for 20 years that all business actually wants is to have a predictable long-term environment. In, you know, th they were just getting used to the idea in America. Maybe we could decarbonize America. There's a lot of money to be made out of this Green New Deal. The first automobile company that says, right, we're going to do it. We're going to produce the, the $30,000 green electric car. It's on the production line. Any color you want, as long as it's green, uh, <laughs> will make money. The, the state has to give a predictability, but the problem, and the, the right, the alt-right, the xenophobes, the fascists, are, are disrupting this by precisely raising in the minds of the fossil fuel industry and the automobile industry, maybe it won't happen. Maybe we'll, we'll all burn, but what do I care? I have a chalet in, the, in, in, in Nevada and go skiing you know, every year because I'll be dead by the time the planet burns. Now, I think that um, that is the struggle of our lifetime. That's what makes the struggle against the right more important. It's not just to defend minorities, women. We are defending the planet as well, and all of those are important. To finish on the question of growth, if we did what I ask in terms of the transition beyond capitalism, we would move large parts of productive activity out of the market. It would not register. Um, there's a joke in economics that says, um, if a millionaire marries his female cleaner, GDP goes down because she's, no, she's still cleaning the house, but for no wages. Um, but I do, it's a sexist joke in a way. But a, a better way of putting it is, when I write an article for The Guardian, that increases GDP. When I write a blog for free or update a Wikipedia page, that doesn't show up in GDP. So if we make the transition beyond the market, GDP growth per se will slow and probably look stagnant. But the degrowth movement wants something more. And I think this is where I part company with them. I want the radicalism to take place at the, at the, at the level of large state actions. And degrowth, I'm, I'm, I don't care about convincing some miners to experience a different lifestyle. 
But when, when I hear the degrowth movement say solar power is bad because it encourages the consumption of energy, that's where I think we, we're not going to win that argument in 12 years. Um, and there's so much more to say, but I know you, there was no time to say it. I will just go, come back to the, the issue of Bogdanov. For me, if, you do, if you've never heard about him, go and find out about him. Because to me, he is the... You know, there is these, as well as sci-fi, there is now a, a whole genre of literature called alt history. What if, what if Lenin fell under a tram in Paris in 1909 and Bogdanov was the leader of the Russian Revolution? We would live in a very different world. Thank indeed, you. indeed. <clears throat> Gracias. Pues nada. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a Paul Mason por, thank you. por venir. Gracias. And thank you to you. And to CCTV. Por la interesantísima. Y muchísimas gracias a vosotros por venir y acompañarnos en esta cita.